Uh, so my job is to, um, is to look at the latest developments in consumer technology, and more interestingly, to see how it affects society and culture, especially the incoming generation. So that's my favorite topic. I found that picture on Flickr, thinking that it would convey drama and impact and change, and <laughs> now I think it just looks like the cover of Dianetics. So you can <laughs> have to change that. Anyway, so I was with the New York Times for 13 years writing the consumer technology column, and um, a little over a year ago, uh, Yahoo hired me away to start this. This is Yahoo Tech. This is my baby. Uh, it's a consumer technology site for non-geeks. And what's really cool is you can click on one of the story tiles to expand the article in place. It doesn't open a new tab or a new window. And those of you who uh, have smartphones, must be one or two of you, uh, know what a big deal that is on a phone because having to navigate multiple windows is complicated and, and ugly. So anyway, uh, that's, that's my baby. I, I, these are my other babies. I have three beautiful children, but I swear to God, sometimes I look at these kids and I see that. There has always been a generation gap from parents to children, always, but in the last five years, it has gotten so much bigger, um, and it is, as Ryan indicated, because of this. Um, iPhone, Android phone, I don't know why they use the word phone in there. Those of you who know people under 17 know that the last thing they'll be caught dead doing is talking into this thing. Um, my kids would not return a phone call if I paid them. Um, but what's cool is all the components that they've packed into this tiny little thing. There's input and output for audio and video. There's all these sensors for light and, and how you're holding it and whether it's up to your face. Um, 14 different wireless antennas in an iPhone, you know, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and cellular. Uh, GPS, uh, gyroscope, a compass. And uh, in the iPhone 6, by the way, a barometer. Because the public was clamoring for, <laughs> we need a barometer. Um, anyway. So that's cool, but what's even cooler is that people can write apps that address all these things, right? So 1.3 million of these currently in the iPhone app store, similar number in the Android store. Um, and this is the, the new category that's exciting me the most. The phone knows where you are from GPS. It knows which way you're facing because of the compass. It knows how you're holding the phone because of the gyroscope. So if you combine all these things, you can create augmented reality apps. These are apps that treat the phone as a video viewer for the world around you, but they superimpose text that identify what you're looking at. I've made a little medley here of them. Um, this one is called Nearest Tube. It's for the London subway system. You look down through the phone, it shows you what subway lines are under your feet. And then you raise it 90 degrees, and it shows you which way to walk to get to those stations. There's one for the New York subway, too. Uh, Asheville will have it as soon as they install a subway in Asheville. Um, this one is called Twitter Round. You point it at a building. It shows you who's on Twitter right now in that building. And then you tap the person's icon, and it shows you what they're saying, which is usually, you know, there's some pervert with a phone out there, you know. Um, this is an experimental app. It uses facial recognition, tells you who you're looking at, and shows you his social media contacts right there on the screen. How great would that be, like at a conference like this one, you know, oh, hi, Bob, you know, like, it would be fantastic. Um, this is another augmented reality app that I actually thought was a hoax when someone sent it to me. It's, this is their YouTube ad. It was called Word Lens. It was a $5 app. It's not a hoax. It's real. Basically, you point it at anything written in Spanish, and it translates it into English in the live video of what you're shooting. I mean, it's the same font, it's the same background. How the, how the heck do they do that? That's, <laughs> that is completely amazing. Uh, sometimes it's very useful information. Um, the, uh, by the way, you can't find this app anymore because Google bought it for $3.7 quintillion uh, and rolled it into Google Translate, but it lives on in Google Translate. Sometimes, you know, for menus, it's very handy. Tongue Bolivian with sauce spicy. Sometimes really important information, you know. Clothes optional on this beach. Um, then you pop into settings, and they now, you can switch the direction and switch the languages to French, German, Italian, even Chinese or Japanese, um, which is incredibly useful. So uh, I made up this next example, but you know it's coming. This is the swine flu app. Can we have audio? 
<laughs> My son is such a good sport. <laughs> He's willing to get infected for a little joke. Um, anyway, so crazy cool. And the most exciting thing about augmented reality is that this is the dawn of it. This is like the Commodore 64 era of this stuff. Pe people are always saying to me, oh my God, the new phones are so thin and so beautiful. No, this is not thin and beautiful. I've been in this business long enough to know this is going to look like an Edsel in five years. You know, this is, we're going to tell our grandchildren, you know, when I was your age, the phones were yay, an eighth of an inch thick. You couldn't roll them up, you know. Um, so that's the exciting part is that, that, that we're just getting started. Um, we're hearing a lot about the Internet of Things this year, I, a term I despise. It's just so grammatically contorted. I mean, who talks like that? You know, I'm going to put on my jeans of blue. It's like, well, I'm going to the city of York. No. Um, it's like Yoda, you know, Internet of Things? Have you? I will, you know. But it, it basically means everyday objects that are now networkable. So they're connected to the internet, they're connected to your phone. Um, there's a million examples. Um, I like this one, I reviewed this last year. This is a little uh, home security camera, the size of a lipstick. You put it on your shelf, and then wherever you go in the world, you can look on your phone and see the view of that, of that camera. So, um, although I have to say their, their advertisement cracks me up on the lower right here. They, they've got the young mom at the office keeping a watchful eye on her newborn back at home. <laughs> Are we thinking this through? You know, like, oh, she's got her head between the bars. That's so cute. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite examples. This is the Nest thermostat, the first internet-connected thermostat. I have two of these at home in Connecticut. Uh, oh, Wow. Okay, so <laughs> I, I, should, I should, so there's nobody home but my kids right now. It's very hot in Connecticut, and I'm looking on my screen at the temperature of the house that they've set it to. 65! <laughs> Do I look like I'm made of money? Oh my God. Anyway, well, hey, look, this is the great thing about an internet-connected thermostat. I can adjust it. But they can put on a goddamn t-shirt. <laughs> it's much better. The power! <laughs> and oh, the conversation we're going to have tonight. Um, anyway, so the, the Nest thermostat is very cool because um, they did some studying and they found out that half of Americans who install programmable thermostats never program them. They're too hard. So this thing has infrared eyes that watch you. They know when you're home and when you go to work, and they program themselves. Um, because apparently Google, who now owns Nest as well, uh, did not have enough personal data about us. So they, uh, anyway. Um, Internet of Things is exploding. The, the cause of it is the, the dawn of these cheap, tiny sensors that they can put in everything. And cheap, tiny sensors are going to be a running theme of everything you hear about this year. Um, Web 2.0 is, is a... 10-year-old concept of, of websites. So this is a Web 1.0 site where the owner of the site puts up the words and the pictures. In Web 2.0, the visitors create the words and the pictures, right? Like Facebook, hugely popular idea, 1.4 million active monthly members. That is one-sixth of the Earth's entire population putting their private information in the hands of this guy. Anyway, um, lots of other examples, Craigslist, free classified ads, Flickr, where you put your pictures for all to see, YouTube, where you put your videos for all to see, um, Wikipedia, where, you know, who, who ever thought this would fly, honestly? <laughs> An uh, encyclopedia where any idiot can write anything. Um, and yet, somehow it works, it's been shown to be as accurate as the Encyclopedia Britannica, which, by the way, last year ceased publication. There's no more printed encyclopedia. Um, I used to love the, the joke columns in the Reader's Digest that my mom used to get, and one of them was this, this column where people would submit um, true life anecdotes from their working lives. 
And this one woman is a college librarian, and she said that on the first week of classes, a freshman walks into the library and says, whoa, what are all those matching books? And she says, like, well, son, that's the encyclopedia. And he goes, dude, somebody actually printed out the whole thing? You'll get it later. It's, it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, anyway, this is another Web 2.0 example um, that you probably don't know about. Um, it's whoissick.org. My kids go to the public school, but I swear to God, they might as well be going to a Petri dish. They come home with the most exotic bugs. So this thing, um, you click off your symptoms on the right there, bloody stool, blurred vision, clammy skin, it's like my kids on a good day. Um, and then you, you sit back and you watch the bugs drift over your neighborhood. How awesome is that? It's, that is phenomenal. So that's Web 2.0. But what's happening this year, well, there's not really a term for it. I'm calling it World 2.0. People call it the sharing economy. This is instead of you going to a brand to do your transaction, you do your business directly with each other. Now, we've been doing that for a while anonymously, like, like with people we sell to on eBay or reviews we leave on Amazon, but we're not entering each other's lives. We're just connecting our interests anonymously. Um, in the sharing economy, um, you actually meet these people and do business with them directly. Airbnb is the poster child. You know, you're going to some city. Instead of renting a hotel room, which is going to be, they're all going to look alike and they're going to be expensive, you rent somebody's apartment who's not going to be there for the week, and you look over the pictures of what it looks like and read up how the guy is and how's the Wi-Fi and where's the bus station. Um, hugely successful. They rented out 13 million nights of lodging last year. They hope to rent out 100 million nights of lodging within five years, which is more than hotels rent. But the same idea is being applied now to everything. So TaskRabbit, this is a site where you list the grunt work you want done, like teach me French or take me to the airport or clean my gutters, and people bid to do it for the least money. It's fantastic. My, my wife is in San Francisco, and she woke up, and she had a big presentation that day, but she was sick. And she's like, oh my god, I have no echinacea, no vitamin C, no Kleenex, this is a disaster. So while she went to the office, I went to TaskRabbit, and I said, I need someone to go to the drugstore and buy this stuff and deliver it to this address, to her desk. And this guy wound up doing it for 20 bucks, and it took him about 25 minutes. He shows up at her office and gives her this stuff with a note that I dictated. She thinks I'm a god. She's, <laughs> how did you do that? Anyway, a little tip for you, gentlemen. Um, anyway, Uber is taking over. It's now in 125 cities in the United States. Um, it started out w with this thing you see here where you'd, you'd open the app, you see the locations of black cars nearby, limousines, and you say, pick me up, and it says, okay, he'll be here in two, year, two minutes, this is his name, this is his rating, and then he picks you up, drives you where you want to go, and when you get out, this is the key to the whole thing, you don't pay anything, you don't take out your wallet or your purse, it's all billed automatically on the back end, so you feel like you have a private chauffeur on call. It's, it's a giddy feeling. Uh, very successful, but also expensive, especially if you get one of the SUV services. But last year they launched Uber X. This is mind-fryingly cool. This is not a chauffeur in a limousine. This is an ordinary person in his family car who's got some time to make a few bucks driving around strangers. So the first time I did this, I was in Chicago, I had to get to the airport, and I know it's usually a $50 ride, she pulls up in a Honda CRV. She's a soccer mom, 40 years old. Her name is Heather. I, I didn't know if I should get in the front seat or the back seat. I'm like, I, how does this even work? You know, so I, like, I got in the front seat. She's like, oh, here, you want a water? Uh, oh, you have an iPhone? Here, I've got the charging cable for you. You know, like, when is a taxi driver ever? You know, and we had this great conversation, and she took me to the airport. It was, I, I mean, I'll never do a taxi again when I, when I have a choice. It was fantastic. She, it, it's so different from, from getting a cab. You know, she, she didn't smell. She didn't hate her life. You know, it was just like this really joyous experience. Oh, right, like your fathers are cab drivers. Give me a break. <laughs> anyway, Lyft is the same idea, also uh, very popular. Um, Parking Panda, same idea, but instead of paying 45 bucks to leave your car at the airport garage, you pay some guy $8 to leave your car in his driveway while you're gone. 
and everybody wins. Uh, dog vacay, instead of kenneling your dog, you, you give it to somebody who loves dogs, and their kids play with it, and they walk it, and he lives in an apartment instead of a cage. Um, rentoid, I love this idea. So this is, this is you rent stuff that not every single American needs to own, right? Uh, snow blower, leaf blower, power drill, uh, trampoline, whatever. Um, I, as I mentioned, I live in Connecticut, and there was this one year five years ago when four people on my street, on the same street, installed swimming pools. The same summer. It was like an arms race. And so my kids were like, Dad, can we get a pool too? And I'm like, no, we really don't need $500,000 holes in the ground on the same street. But I'll tell you what I will do. I will call those four families and make the following offer. If we can come and swim when you're not using the pool, then I'll pay half your maintenance fees for the pool. And of the, of the four, guess how many said yes? Zero. I told you, it was Connecticut. <laughs> you will not put your skin in my water, you know. <laughs> Honestly. Um. So anyway, so I'm a huge fan of this idea. And the, the cool thing is, think about when it happened. Right? It happened in the last two or three years during the recession when everybody either needed to make more money or needed to save money on what they were spending. And all of these sharing economy things cut out the brand and go person to person. Very disruptive, especially the taxi and limousine commissions. They hate it. There are protests and, and petitions and tire slashings. Um, but you know what? This, this is the future. This is, you can't put this genie back in the bottle. Um, and more and more and more industries are going to be shaken up in this exact way. Um, hearing a lot about wearable tech, <laughs> although maybe not so much about Google Glass anymore, um, this, this was an amazing technological tour de force. It put, you know, puts a little screen above your eyebrow that shows you all the sorts of things that would be on your phone, you know, driving directions and text messages and stuff like that. Um, the problem was not the technology of it. They, they've, it, it failed horribly, and, and they've been pulled off the market. Um, they're working on a new version for next year uh, where the earpieces will fold and some other, other improvements. But um, the problem that they had was the social problem, right? Like, first of all, you show up with these things on your face like a cyborg. You know, you spent $1,500. You know, there's a smugness to the whole thing. Um, I met a woman from Google at, at CES, and she was wearing them while she was talking to me. She's like, so, David, how are you liking Yahoo? And I'm like, take those freaking things off! You know, for all I knew, she was filming me or, and, and broadcasting it to the internet. I didn't know. Um, but I, I think, you know, overall, that's, that's the idea. They've been banned in restaurants, banned in movie theaters, of course, uh, banned in courtrooms, God knows locker rooms. Um, so, uh, and, and, and there has emerged a nickname for people who, who did buy these. They, they call them glass holes. And, and well-deserved, I say. <laughs> um, the, the new version will have a record light that tells you when you're being recorded. Right now, you don't know. It's just unbelievably obnoxious. And I can't believe they missed that on the first go-around. Um, anyway, I don't know if they'll disappear entirely. They, they remind me a little bit of the Segway scooter. When it first came out, everybody said, oh my god, they're going to redesign cities to accommodate this thing. And now, who has them? Like, mall cops. You know. <laughs> so this is, this is going to find its niche, but it'll be like, you know, surgeons, you know, augmented reality. You know, Doctor, what is this structure here? It appears to be the kidney, you know, like, uh, or, or aircraft maintenance. You know, there, there, it, there it has some use. But the cool thing, the, the wearable technology that's going to catch, off, catch on hugely and change everything are the fitness trackers. And I don't mean these old glorified pedometers like the up band. I mean, they're getting really sophisticated. This, this new one tracks your heart not every 10 minutes like the Apple Watch, but continuously through the day and night. So it really knows when you're asleep. Um, the amazing thing is, to us, our health, our medicine, what, what check-in to your bodily's health, body's health did you have before these? You had 10 minutes at your checkup once a year. Now you're wearing a medical device, 24 hours a day. It shows you how much you know, activity you're getting, how much sleep you're getting, um, and what happens to you when you're asleep. Like, how many times were you in REM sleep? How many times did you wake up? It's fascinating information. And 
you also plug in your wife's or your boyfriend's or your boss's. So Nikki is my wife, and I see her data as well. So it's like health through humiliation. You know, it's like... Um, and, you know, the Apple Watch is, is very big on this. It, it monitors all day long how much time you've spent standing, how much time you've spent exercising and just moving around. It has all these sensors on the back that are constantly looking through your skin to evaluate the blood. Uh, this is a huge, huge thing. The number of devices pouring out. We're going to buy 70 million of these this year. 70 million Fitbits. Um, look at all of these. And not just, not just step counting. I'm, I'm t I'm, this one tracks how much sunlight you get. This one monitors your posture. It beeps at you if you slouch. Um, this, this is a health tracking scale. It measures your body composition and your biological age. My wife got one of these, and she's like, she's 46, and she's like, oh, look, honey, it says I'm 37. She's a marathon runner, blah, blah, blah. Um, and she's like, you try it. And so I come over, I'm 52, and it goes, you're 59. <laughs> Obviously a piece of crap. Um, still in its infancy. Um, but anywhere you can put a sensor against your skin, they are putting them, right? So these are the health tracking t-shirts. And earbuds, it gets your, your pulse rate while you're listening to your music because your ears are a great place to, to sense your, your heart rate. Uh, this is the health tracking helmet and sweatband and bicycle cap. And this goes under your mattress and it does a much more scientific job of tracking your sleep than the wristbands do. Uh, this is the health tracking bra. Um, this is the health tracking socks. This is the health tracking fork. Oh, yeah. I reviewed this thing. It's 100 bucks. uses galvanic response. When, you're, when the tines touch your lips, it knows that you've taken a bite. And it, it's, it's designed to tell you when you're scarfing down your food too fast. So that you leave the phone next to your plate, and it goes all red and beeps and goes, eh, slow down when you're eating too fast. It's like, it's like having your mom with you at every meal. It's like, um, the next slide I'm a little nervous about. Um, I'm just, I'm just the messenger here. You're all adults. I think you can handle it. I'm telling you, anywhere you can put a sensor against your skin, yes, this is the sex fit. You knew it was coming. This is for the gentleman to wear during times of intimacy. And it, it monitors his rate and his vigor. <laughs> and at your option, you can have your data uploaded in real time to Facebook. <laughs> yeah, there are some places Bluetooth should not go. <laughs> um, so there's been some criticism of these things, like, oh, the wristbands are nothing more than an accelerometer, a tilt sensor. Uh, it knows in three dimensions how you're moving. That's all it does. And the software has to figure out what activity that corresponds to. Are you walking? Are you sleeping? And the Times did this great infographic where they pointed out that as far as the accelerometer is concerned, doing bicep curls is precisely the same motion as eating Doritos. <laughs> but you know what? For the most part, these are not meant to be medical instruments. These are, these are motivational devices, and they really, really do a good job of that. Um, the most frustrating thing t about this movement to me was that I heard uh, uh, doctors at a conference say to me, the real bummer about the explosion of these things is that the cure for cancer is there in those terabytes of data that these things are spewing out every day. But the researchers can't get at it, the doctors can't see it, it's all siloed by brand. Uh, you couldn't share your Fitbit data with your doctor if you wanted to. It's all locked away. Um, and if we could parse it, if we could collect it and parse it and sort it the right way, we'd find, we'd make amazing medical breakthroughs. So anyway, so that would have been the end of this segment of the talk and we, you would have been as depressed as I am. But two weeks ago, this happened and it's totally under everyone's radar. It is the biggest thing to happen in technology in decades. It's a thing from Apple. And all it is is it lets um, individuals opt in to share their data with medical researchers. 
So you know who the researchers are, what the purpose of the study is, and which data you want us to share. Um, you're in control, you can drop out at any time. It is anonymized data, it doesn't have your name on it, but it is already revolutionizing medical studies. Um, for Yahoo Tech, I interviewed this guy at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York who did an asthma app, and it's so clever. So you answer three questions every day if you have asthma, like did you use your inhaler, how did you feel today? And then in the background, this thing knows where you are with GPS, and guess what that means? He knows what the pollen count, the pollution level, and the heat index were for where you were. So they can correlate all this data with asthma attacks in a way. So his last study, it took him two years to get 200 participants in his study. Three days after this came out, he had 3,500 people enrolled. Like, and, 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 and not locally either, globally. Like normally a study has to be done locally because how do you get your participants? You put up flyers, you, sit, you put an ad in the paper. So anyway, huge. This is the Parkinson's app. Um, it tracks, it's for Parkinson's patients. Um, they, they do things like it says to tap these two buttons as fast as you can. And over time it'll track your symptoms and your progress as a Parkinson's patient. And what's cool is a lot of these, like this one, are also available to healthy people who don't have Parkinson's. Your data is useful as a control. Anyway, I just get so excited. This is gonna just change everything with medical research. We've entered the age of autonomous everything. The Google self-driving cars have driven millions of miles without a single accident caused by the, by the car. Actually, they've been in 11 accidents. All 11 happened when a person took hold of the wheel. Um, and, and most of them were things like they were stopped at a light and somebody rear-ended them. Like, what's the robot supposed to do about that? Um, but anyway, people say, I don't want to share my road with some computer. I'm like, I don't want to share my road with you. People are the worst drivers. Oh, here's the kindergartner test. Ah. Anyway, um, drones happening in a big way, revolutionizing filmmaking and engineering. You know, now they inspect skyscrapers and pipelines without having to risk their lives. Amazon is offering us this idea. Um, this is the 30-minute prime air delivery where you order something and a drone picks it up from their warehouse and flies it to you. Um, this was on 60 Minutes, this video here. And for a while, it looked like the FAA was going to kill all of this. They were going to say, um, you know, drones are too dangerous and put big restrictions, but they've made an exception for Amazon. Although, I don't know, I'm, I'm not totally sold on this. I, this is America, you know. People are going to be like, well, look, honey, looks like a Samsung TV. <laughs> so anyway, so those are some of the big technologies coming down the pike. The really interesting question is, how does it change us? How does it change the incoming generation? Um, I'm sure you've heard all the, the data on millennials. Um, they're, they're being called entitled and narcissistic, and yet they're idealistic. They want jobs that mean something. Uh, they tend to be detached from institutions, but heavily networked with friends. 91 of them expect to change jobs within three years. Startling. Uh, they seek a, a transparency and authenticity from the brands they deal with. Um, and I would hate to be in the advertising industry because 1% uh, say they, would tr they might trust a brand more after seeing a compelling ad. 68% would buy something after seeing something on Facebook about it. So, yikes. Although, I don't need to tell you guys, looks like most of you are millennials. You're still in the millennial stage, or the larval stage, some of you. Um, but anyway, but from a technology standpoint, there are some other millennial traits that, that businesses are going to have to deal with. Everything has to be real time. Do you know that use of email by the under 25 set in five years has declined 62%? They don't do email, and they don't do voicemail either. They don't do the store and forward method. Everything has to be real time. Twitter, Facebook, text messages. Everything has to be on demand. Your music, your, your TV, your movies from Netflix, your Kindle books and newspapers. Uh, I was speaking to a, an HR guy from Microsoft, and he told me that he's getting applications from recent college graduates to work at Microsoft, leaving two fields blank. The home phone number, of course, because they don't have a home phone, and the email address. They don't even have one. Um, and then I told this story at a conference, and a guy came up to me afterwards, and he said that he does orientation for new hires right out of college. He has had to add to the orientation a segment on how to 